Um, yeah, uh, it was uh, 1978, about 20 miles west of Denver. I'm really nervous. Okay, so, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, me and a buddy of mine, I was 13 years old. Like, basically, what, what, what we'd done is we kind of snuck out of the house at night, you know. I, mean, I, I, I did that in my day. Um, and uh, can I mention last names? Uh, no. Okay. Um, and uh, this was uh, Lookout Mountain Road, Relia Park. And we come around the corner, and there's a there's a recreation area on the right side. It's, they have company picnics in there, and they got a baseball diamond, picnic tables, etc. Right. And there's this thing standing on the pitcher's mound. Really? Beating a dead dog with a stick. Beating a dead dog with a stick? Yes, sir. Uh, about nine feet tall. Wasn't human. Uh, could tell that right away. Uh, right across the street is the Jefferson County Nature Center, and there's a big stone gate. Yeah. And uh, we, it's about 100 yards away, and there's about a 60-mile-an-hour Chinook wind blowing. We get behind the gate, and we're watching this, and it's got this dog by the tail, and it's beating this dog on the head. Uh, with it had the dog in the left hand, stick in the right, um, holding it out, you know. And uh, my friend's name was Jody. And uh, I turned to him, and I whispered. I forget what I whispered. I think I said, you know, can you believe this or, you know, whatever. This thing turned its head towards us. <laughs> and we're talking 100 yards. Yes. Uh, heavy wind. We were downwind from it. Right. It took off running, covered 200 yards in, I'd say, four seconds. Hmm. And um, galvanized ranch gate. Maybe we ought to call him fast foot. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, um, you know, the UFO thing, you know, I think there's a relationship uh, between the two. Um, and a related story in 1984, which about six years later, uh, friend of, uh, friends of mine on the mountain, David and Wendy, they found a human hand in their uh, in their dog pen. Bad. And uh, they called the cops. The cops came up. Cops traced it, and they found uh, this tourist from New York City buried in this in this uh, snowdrift without a hand. And they they basically ne they they never ascertained if it was uh, 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 buried by a human or an animal. Um, I don't know if that, if it's related. Um, but it happened in the same general area. Well, I liked your Bigfoot story most. That was pretty good. Uh, uh, you swear on all that's holy. I that's... swear on it, and, and I have told this story, and I've been ridiculed for it. Um, I've told it in greater detail. You know, I feel that I'm a little. It's a little more urgent because I'm on talk radio, and you know. But uh, well, look, I... Jody, if you're out there, you know who you are, <laughs> um, and everybody out there knows who they are if they ridicule me for it. Um, but I swear to God. Well, I shall not, sir. Thank you very much for the call. It's easy to ridicule. It's easy to uh, criticize. Anybody, as Congressman Schiff said, and there are a lot of small, narrow minds out there who um, can do nothing but criticize. And uh, because it, you know, a certain subject is not of interest to them, uh, they act quickly to jump and make fools of those who would come and tell the story, as this young man just did. I appreciate it. I would not uh, uh, try to make a fool of you, sir, and um, I don't do that on this program. These are open lines, and I'll listen to everybody uh, fairly. At least I'll try to. Anyway, needing a focus of hate, some guy sent me a fax from L.A. saying, you want somebody to hate, watch you hate my neighbor, Steve. Steve is human slime. He is the worst neighbor. He's the neighbor from hell. I hate Steve. And, in fact, Steve's everywhere are about the same. So we should hate Steve's. And uh, it had some merit. And it kind of went from there. And uh, the Steve's of the world are obviously in some sort of cahoots. And they've got something planned. We're not sure what it is, but the Steves know. So anyway, we've we've begun a sort of a hate Steve thing, and uh, it makes people feel better. So this next call, uh, for some context, it was, uh, the show was February 24th, 2002. You know, not that long after 9-11, 
and uh, I believe the uh, it wasn't that long after the Paris bombings as well. And so uh, this caller, um, well, that's the context. That's the context. So uh, here's the call. They don't know, and it could be terrorism. Uh, who the hell knows at this point? Right. You you know what's happening right now is that it, it, it's really crazy. I've been watching. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not odd, but I know where a few people from um, the Palestinian nation are, where they hang out here in the valley. Yeah. I've been watching these people and being following him really close, standing next to him. And uh, what he said about all these terrorist attacks, like um, people blowing up malls and stuff like that, it's giving these people ideas. And and um, I think somebody, these people, I've watched a few of them, and it may sound crazy. These people, I, I, I've been hired by private investigative agencies for working comp work and stuff, so I'm really good at being invisible with my, like when your shows work. And I stand right behind these people. I follow them around to libraries or wherever they go. And I'm one person, I'm really scared that maybe going to do something. It's a female. Well, and, then, and, listen, sir, if, if you really believe that, then you need to go to the FBI right away. Yeah, but you know what? It's really crazy. These people, the ones that I've been watching, they're not crazy. They're, they're, they're actually depressed. I've seen some of these people actually talking, and they're, like, crying. These pe- I don't know what's wrong with these people. There's, there's something missing out of this, this puzzle because these people Well, are, I, I do, sir. Listen, um, what it is is that... Uh... <sighs> If you were a Palestinian, uh, if you were of Arab extraction in America right now, you wouldn't be having much of an uh, easy time of it, would you? I mean, you really wouldn't have an easy time of it at all. You'd be watched. Uh, People would stare at you. Uh, Everybody would be uneasy around you. And you, you really, everybody has got to remember that most of the people of these various, uh, of Arab extraction specifically, are uh, fine people and do not wish us dead. You've got to delineate between the average population of the Arab world and the fanatics. And uh, I'm not uh, suggesting they are few in number. There are many fanatics who want us dead, D-E-A-D, dead. And so to... Uh, delineate between the two is uh, impossible for some people, and so a, a lot of very innocent people are suffering here in America. So if you're wondering what's wrong with them, you don't have to wonder very long. That's it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to slaughter this name, uh, the Chip of Bogwas. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to have a class in this. I, now, I, now, I, let, I, I can only do it one at a time. Let, say this. Chupa. Chupa. Cabra. Cabra. Now say it quickly. Chupa Cabra. You got it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you've noticed the similarity between them and the old gargoyles uh, from medieval times. I have indeed. Uh, would it, could it be possible that this is something that uh, has a long gestation period in an egg form and comes out every so often? Yes. And then disappears again? It could uh, be. And uh, maybe there's been a few that stick around that, that you know, that reproduce eggs. They don't, they're not being many of them, so they're seen very rarely, but then all of a sudden there's a there's a huge population of them for a while, and then they disappear again. Well, that could be. Or it could be that they're presently breeding like rabbits, and the human race is going to have to deal with a monster. Well, you know, I, yeah, you know, we we sort of do it tongue in cheek, but it's, it, I'm beginning to believe that they exist. Uh, I know you got the tape. Is that is that correct? Uh, as long as it's OPB, other people's blood, it's easy to joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm reviewing the tape. Uh, it may not be of a chupacabra, but it's awfully big, so I'm trying to decide about that. That's what I wondered, if maybe it was doctored or something like that. I'm no, thinking. not doctored. I don't think doctored. Uh, I've just got to figure out what it is. It's gigantic and it's ugly. Uh, was it dead? Or I see, I, I oh, yeah. listened to your show. show absolutely, absolutely dead. Uh, it would seem like they would have some kind of autopsy report on TV, but then again, TV never... Produces well, this that... is big, big news uh, in Mexico. Thank you very much for the call. Big news in Mexico. It is the talk of Mexico now. For those of you who are just joining us, the chupacabra is 
Well, it began apparently in Puerto Rico, uh, showed up in South America, Central America, traceable to the north, Texas, California, even reports in Oregon. And um, it is the talk of Mexico. It is headline news everywhere in Mexico. It was headline news in Phoenix yesterday. So, you know, whatever it is, it's something. I don't know if it's some mystical, mythological creature, something new, something from a lab, something from some portal through time or another dimension or whatever it is. Who knows? Maybe it's just an evolutionary step for something else that was here. Whatever it is, I don't want to meet one. And uh, you ought to take a look at that. It's, uh, this layering business is amazing. Call us toll-free at 1-800-618-8255. Hold it, hold it. Tom, you're not allowed to give your, your last name on the air. Turn your radio off, Tom. That's number one. Okay, I got it off. And number two, uh, please don't give us your last name, just your first name. Tom in Nashville, right? No, Madisonville, Kentucky. Boy, I missed that one by a mile. Okay. Well, you're on the air. Okay. Proceed. Okay. Who am I talking to? A robot. A robot. <laughs> to speak to Art Bell, say, Art Bell, now. Okay, Mr. Art, uh, I'm kind of interested in this uh, stuff you've been talking about. Uh, outer space stuff? Where, what, what have you been talking about here on this show here? Well, how can you be interested if you're not sure what we're talking about? Well, because uh, I'm a dumb old boy from Kentucky. <laughs> well, people uh, in Kentucky can still think, can't they? Well, I'm I'm trying to think, uh, trying to get get to where you're at. No, nope. uh, is this uh, a lost satellite or what? What is he picked up here? Is it what? What what kind of outfit is he picked up here? Is it that you got in a museum? Uh, what outfit is he picked up? It's in a museum. I I'm not sure what you mean. Well, Art been talking about this, discussing with these people about what he's found. Um, oh, you mean the uh, the parts? Yeah, the parts. All right. Well, I, look, just briefly. All right, fine. Briefly, and I mean briefly. What happened is um, it's been, I don't know, six months now ago or seven or eight, whatever it is, long time ago, somebody sent me some metal metal fragments that are alleged to have been from the Roswell crash of 1947, or Socorro. And I, actually, that is one thing I don't identify, and that is the actual crash site specified in the letters for good reason. But they sent me all these metal pieces, and we have had them ex ever since then. We have been trying to determine what the hell they are. The ones sent me were bismuth and magne magnesium. Bismuth is a very strange element. And magnesium, and layered. Nobody can duplicate it. Nobody knows what it is, and so forth and so on. So this has been ongoing now for months and months, and we've put it through every conceivable test except a few left that we have yet to do. And we have let, uh, contrary to what it says in that, I said, you know, why would they write something like that, talk show host, hiding saucer parts? I, couldn't, I, I picked that up earlier today, you know, out of the mail, and I looked at that and I said, oh, my God. Look, it's a tabloid. But, you know, now I'm told it isn't a tabloid. It's tabloid-like. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello there. Goodbye. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Yeah, hi, Art. Hello. Mr. Negative here. Uh, Mr. Negative. Yeah. What are you negative about? Your ads. Okay. You know, in January, I bought one of those Beijing radios, you know? Yes. Very fine radio, by the way. Yes, it is. But you keep saying, buy it soon, because soon we're going to run out. Yep. We don't know. It's like day-to-day, -day, well, I, I said last night. Um, day-to-day. -day. Um, you see, the, these come from South Africa. They're shipped in containers to San Francisco. Uh, the factory has warned us that um, the shipments have stopped, but there is a lag time. In other words, it takes a long time for a ship to come from South Africa to um, San Francisco, and then for the you know the containers to be offloaded 
and gone through by customs and all that baloney and make it to where we can sell them. So we are not exactly sure when the last of the supply is coming. It's literally now on a day-to-day -day basis is your answer. Well, it, it just seems funny to me. Why? It's not funny. Because you when you're selling something that's very popular, you don't want to run out of it. It's not funny. Well, it, it seems to me that they should have somewhat more control over their inventory. Or the well, they don't. Look, South Africa is, an, A, a very new country. Uh, B, the manufacturing is um, not exactly on a scale that we have it here. And C, there's transportation from South Africa to the U.S. and customs, as I explained to you. So there are a lot of uncontrollable things there. Okay, so they don't know if the last ship is set sail? or It may have, yeah. Oh. Uh, we think that it has, uh, but we don't know. So there you go. Okay. Well, that was it. Well, anyway, glad you're now informed. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, at first, I wanted to answer a question for you about the, uh, you would ask me in the show about uh, how the Soviet subs have gotten quieter. Yes. Uh, what happened was, I think it was Mitsubishi. Yep. Sold them the plans for the machine that makes our screws. Right. So that's, that's how that happened. Yeah, I recall. I recall the story. Um, and then I, I believe that uh, Soviet subs, from that point, became roughly as quiet as ours, and our lead in detection uh, virtually evaporated. Yeah, they were, they were a lot quieter, but their engine rooms were still a lot noisier. Mm -hmm. So that's how we basically heard them was a tonal from their engine room. Mm. Um, and that guy there, he's, uh, he's crazy for talking like that. Uh, you know, we signed a piece of paper that said we, we forgot everything when we get out. Uh -huh. For him to, I mean, give his boat. You know, they, they could track him, especially officers. They're on a, a totally different path than enlisted people. I understand. And uh, I was enlisted on subs, and I, you know, probably didn't, you know, do as much as he did in terms of uh, crypto, but... Well, I think one of two things occurred, and this is just me speculating. Either uh, over the period of the hour and 40 minutes we did the interview, either A, he became scared on his own, or B... He got a call, uh, as he mentioned, during the break, but it wasn't from work. Oh, I, I, I doubt that. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure they, uh, they contacted him. Yeah. Because uh, w when you're an officer, I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't you're, – you're, um, you can be called back at any time. Like when a list of guy finishes his tour of duty, he, he's out. Mm -hmm. But an officer, uh, you know, their ID cards say uh, uh, indefinite for the expiration date. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's still susceptible to UCMJ just like uh, – as if he was an active duty personnel. On the other hand, uh, what he described was pretty damn scary. Uh, oh, if it oh, occurred, yeah. and I, I frankly believe every word that he said. I yeah, he, he, he sounded pretty, uh, pretty convincing. He's only like maybe a couple discrepancies that I noticed when I was 10 years in the submarine force. What did you notice that didn't sound right? Oh, we never call submarine ships. They're called boats. It was always like a, a nitpick thing. You know, when you were doing your submarine qualifications, uh -huh. if you ever called it a ship, it was it, it was it's a boat. That was the first one. And uh, uh, boomers don't carry Mark 48s. Only uh, fast attack boats carry Mark 48s. Well, I think that he was referring to the uh, the Dallas with the Mark 48s. Well, that's right. He said he was out of Dallas on the Dallas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that makes sense then. So yeah, that was the only thing I saw that was wrong. I just. Uh, you know, and, I, and the things about the floating wires, so, yeah, we used to cut those things all the time, especially if you were to broach every once in a while, which means uh, your sail kind of sticks out of the water a little bit when you're in rough seas. Right. And, uh, hell, yeah, we used to cut that thing all the time. That's why we carried, like, two or three on board. But, yeah, I, I, I can't believe that he actually said all that stuff. Huh. Um, I, I appreciate your comments. I, I, I don't know what to say. I'm... I'm still contemplating the seriousness of what he said to us. Yeah, that's, that's pretty terrible. That's about as close as I've ever heard. And, uh, you know, things get around in the sub community. You can't really keep uh, something like that a secret for too long. You know, you, you, you move from place to place so much. You get to a school. You meet new friends. You get comfortable with them. You start talking. You know, little things pop up, at, you know, during a beer or something like that. I, I, I'm just shocked that he actually said.
that's something like that over the air to 15 million some odd people. Were you an officer? No, I was. Uh, I was a nuke. I was uh, back aft doing the reactor plant. Mm -hmm. I was enlisted. Why would you think he told us? What do you think his motivation was? Uh, I would say he probably came to a point where the more he thought about it, the more it, it, it bugged him, and he wanted to get the word out to people, let them know uh, how close we come. Uh, I mean, once you launch, it's a uh, you know, it's, it's, you can't stop it. It's, it's going to go no matter what you do. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't see. I, I have only been out for like two years now, and I would never. Uh, I mean, you know, we everyone has run-ins and subs. You, you do kind of, you know, weird things, and there's always like a, a chance for something to go wrong. But I would never, ever talk about it on the air. I, can, I, I don't know what would motivate him to do that. Uh, um. Maybe he's hoping there'll be some kind of change. I, I'm not really sure what kind of change can change the hearts and the minds of individuals faced in a crisis situation the way he was at that point. So I, I'm sitting here trying to think, you know, his motivation might have been to produce some sort of change in procedure or the thinking of the military, he complained about that, that yeah, a limited nuclear war might be possible or is becoming more possible now. Yeah, but he was a lieutenant junior grade in the service, uh, you know, coming on the air and saying all this, that, that's not going to change a thing. They're, they're pretty, uh, you know, military set in its ways, you know, a typically a traditional institution. And, uh, you know, they're going to listen to the general before they listen to the lieutenant JG. Mm -hmm. so, uh, all right. I appreciate your call. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. On my special combo line, you are on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Where are you? I'm in California. California. We have an echo. Hold on a minute here. Let me see what I can do about that. Uh, let me try it now. That should be better. You're in California. Yes. All right. Uh, do you fit into the category of a man in black, a time traveler, or one who possesses a time machine? I'm in the man in black. You're a man in black? Yes. <sighs> I'm shocked that I am getting so many men in black. Now, I thought... Never would I get a man in black because they are so secretive, uh, so many levels, no doubt, above top secret, that we could never get one to call, and yet here you are. Here all right. I am. Yes, all right. Um, may I ask uh, how one might go in behalf of a faxer about getting a job uh, with the men in black? Is there a way one can apply? Uh, there's not really a way you can apply for a men in black. You kind of fall into it. Is this um, just you, one of those, they come to you, or? Well, you, you go through certain levels. You, I, I started out in the military uh -huh. as just a regular, you know, went through boot camp. Uh, sure. You know, went in the military, went to a special service, and uh, was given the offer, and I figured, what the hell, I might as well try it out. I mean, I was single. I had no family. Um, well, so what I, did I have to lose? I remember it, when I was in the Air Force. Now, yeah. they used to post uh, job openings for... Um, a career field changes that you could apply for. I right. mean, did you go into the barracks one day or the first sergeant's office and there was a little thing saying uh, men in black openings? Uh... No, no. I mean, uh, they, they don't recruit like uh, a guy at a boot camp. I see. I mean, you, you're not like a seaman apprentice or a seaman recruit when they say, hey, uh, how would you like to be a men in black? Uh, and normally, uh, most of the men in black are officers that are, are strictly given security clearances and they're told, um, you know, I'm sure you remember the old page 13 where, where you're told, okay, uh, you've given up your right to uh, be a normal American and have the normal, uh, yes. you know, rights of everybody else. I've heard that. And uh, so, I mean, what did I have to lose? I've, I've always wanted to know. I mean, I remember as a kid, I always wanted to know what was going on, and I figured this was the best course to take. All right. What is a general description, job description, of what you do? Well, you know... I listened to some of the other people uh, you had had on about the, the hierarchy and uh, yes. this and that. And uh, we are basically out there yes. to control secrets of the government. Okay? I mean, uh, a lot of times the secrets get out. How, but how do you sleep at night? I mean, going around intimidating people. Well, I mean, you wouldn't be intimidated by a men in white. Well, yeah, I, I mean, know I understand that part of it, but I mean, actually intimidating them, or worse yet, breaking into a place and stealing evidence and that sort of thing. How do you sleep at night? How do you live with yourself? Well, well, because basically, you know, 
from, from our point of view, we feel that it, national security of the United States is, is, is our prime motive. Oh, my God. There's been so much done in the name of national security, though. I, I know. I know. I mean, I, the I, people I, feel like they have a right to know. Well, they do have a right to know, but... Well, not, not according to you guys. You go around stealing evidence and covering things up and... Well, we don't per se. Well, in some some instances we do steal God knows evidence. We probably even kill occasionally. But we look at the big picture of things. I mean, uh, say you know we were to let out that okay, there's a carburetor out there that's going to get 125 miles to the gallon. I bet you got a bun bunch of those. I, well, I just... we may or may not. I mean, uh, you know, there's there's there certain certain of us that that work for oil companies and and, and protect their interests. That figures. And there's certain of us that work for insurance companies to protect their interests. That there's certain figures. of us that work for energy companies and yeah. and you know, you know, uh, in fact, nuclear power is. is is one of the interests that we that we try to to go against, because basically, you know, you can go through. In other words, you're on the side of the oil company, and you you see nuclear power as a threat, a threat. to the oil industry, and you're acting in behalf of the oil industry. And that that was my my prime job was <sighs> for for the oil companies. Don't you have guilt about that? I mean, we are polluting our air. Our uh, environment is fouled, and you're protecting these old burners and, and providers of fossil fuels that are destroying our atmosphere. Well, I, I wouldn't be calling if I didn't feel guilty. Ah, so you're sort of like a man in black whistleblower, sort of. Well, not a whistleblower. It's just that uh, something occurred in my life that, that, that made me kind of look at the, the other side of the spectrum. What was that? Uh, I, I met a woman, and I fell in love and had children. Is that a not? Uh, is that generally uh, not a thing that a man in black would do? Uh, we're supposed to basically be on our own, uh, no ties. This way, we have no no commitments to other parties other than what, what our job is. You you're, you don't take vows of celibacy. <laughs> well, not not vows of celibacy, but uh, but they don't want you settling. But they down don't want us settling down and beginning of the family thing. Makes sense and, uh, to me, sure. So. Uh, what happened is when I had children, I started looking at the big picture, and I, I said to myself, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have children. You know, I have responsibility. I have, uh, you know, my, my kids, you know, when I'm in my, you know, I'm in my 60s, they're in their 20s, they're going to be going through things that, you know, I, I tried to stop from, from doing all, yes. all in the cost for money. Well, when you try to quit or uh, leave the men in black, is it like, I, I, I mean, in the mafia, you generally don't quit. You're terminated permanently. Yeah, and, and, and you know, you, you you think you're smarter and you can keep one step ahead. Yeah. But, uh, you know, sometimes people think they're so smart, and, uh, you know, I fell into the same hole where I told you, get screwed out of this one to be blatant. Well, you're a very heroic individual. Uh, are they going to continue the policy of... Uh, Promoting fossil fuels, hiding um, carburetors, pumping. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, it, as long as there's money there and there's people that can, you know, make it big, I'm sure they will. Is the ultimate boss of the men in black a woman in black? Uh, no. You, so that was false? Well, uh, uh, yes. Uh, there are no women in black per se. I mean, there's women in the community of of, of the the organization, but they're not. Uh, I mean, there may be women that are in charge of certain divisions or certain sectors of the organization, but uh, what would happen? What would happen? Now, you say the average man in black is not married, doesn't have family, children, that sort of thing, right? Well, yes. But he has no, all the normal urges of a man, right? Of course. So you would assume that he has a relationship, at least at some shallow level, with women. If a man in black would utter to a woman what he does for a living, and she she had knowledge of this, right? What would happen to her? Uh, well, if, if they, if, I mean, they don't, they don't, I mean, constantly monitor us. I would assume I, 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 everything would be okay unless it was a plant, and, you know, to test our loyalty. They but, do. But I mean, I, you know, I, with with the, the current woman I'm in love with, and I've had children with. I mean, I, I waited years and years. I mean. It, it, you know, it's not paranoia. It's more of, you know, I'm not going to get this person involved in what I do if, if I know it's going to hurt her in any way. And I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, you have found a woman, and and that you are, you know, a soulmate. Yes. With. Yes, indeed. 
and, and and you don't want anything to happen to that woman that would ever put her in danger. You're damn right. Because basically what it boils down to is, I mean, love is the ultimate power. I mean, there's someone that you meet on the street corner, you see that, you know, you, you may meet 20 women before you, but it's that one woman that just kind of, for some reason, you just can't seem to stop thinking about. Well, that's love. That That's love. Love, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, I... I wouldn't want my if, wife. Look, uh, obviously, you're being heard now by millions. Your old bosses huh, are listening. Obviously. What would you say to them? Uh, too late now, isn't it? I mean, uh, granted, that there's a certain amount of skepticism with people listening to your show. Yes. I mean, they, they take a little bit for uh, being truth fact, uh, kidding around, joking around. Yep, sure. Uh, but, it, you know... It, what What could you say, if we were to say to you... We doubt what you're saying. We don't believe you. What could you say that would help us believe you? Well, l look at what the government has come out with over the few years, okay? The CIA has admitted uh, that they, yes, indeed, did plant stories about UFOs to cover the U-2 spy planes and the SR-71. It's true. It's true. Uh, they did indeed do tests on um, African-American males to see how they would react to uh, Tuskegee uh, sexual experiment. diseases. And, yeah, that's true. Dead kids, plutonium, it goes exactly. on and on and it's on and terrible. on. So, in other words, if we, if, if we embrace that as the truth, then, then we should embrace what you are saying as the truth. It is Nothing easily is as believable. Yeah, it's you true. Know, you know, you've got to look at everything that, at the core of, of every conspiracy theory or everything that's going on. There is a certain amount of truth. I understand. And, and you know, the, you know I, I would not fault the, the people that, that make these decisions because, to them, they're looking... They're looking uh, the United States has to be number one. Can I okay. ask you? Can I ask you a really hard question? Sure. As a man in black. Okay. Have you ever had to take a life? Kill? No. You don't have to. Have you ever had to rough somebody up? Uh, not so much rough somebody up, uh, but I mean, standing on a street corner, following someone, stalking somebody. You know, dressed in a black suit with black glasses and staring at someone and always being there. Yep. I mean, letting them know that you're there is enough to, to, to you know, give someone the willies. So the job, then, is intimidation. Well, why not? I mean, it's the same as a, a police officer. You're driving down the road. Yeah, that's true. You see a cop hanging out on the side of the road. Are you going to speed up to 70 miles an hour or are you going to slow down at 55? I mean, it's deterrence. Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, if you were to look out and see at the edge of your property some black skulking figure with a black hat and a black suit, and uh, I, as a matter of fact, you know, it's funny. I had a caller not that long ago who said that he saw a man in black. It's when we were doing the show on that, and he said he looked down and he saw this man in black, and he stood there and watched him until finally the man in black raised his hand and simply pointed, acknowledging that it was that man that he was there watching. In other words, it was the finger of intimidation. Exactly. And that's all it takes in most cases, huh? In most cases. And then uh, and another thing we do is, I mean, once the evidence is gone, yes. how are you going to prove it's one against the other? Okay? My word against yours. That's right. And, uh, I mean, uh, the media... Listen, I mean, I, I, I've got to go. Okay. I've got to go, but uh, I, you sound like the real deal to me, all right? Okay. Thank you very much, and we will talk with you once again. Another man in black. Intimidation. I, I always thought that was their real job. On my vampire line, you're on the air. Good morning, Mr. Bell. Good morning. You wanted to speak to a vampire? That's right. A real one. That's correct. You're talking to one. The name's Peter. I have been a vampire since October 21st, 1927. Wait a minute. October 21st, 1927? Exactly. You're then obviously uh, immortal? Exactly. How did you become a vampire? I was brought into this world by... My master, his name was Gregory. He took me in on that date after I surrendered my soul to him. Um, you know what I'm curious about? How did Gregory talk you into it? 
I had just lost my love to another man. In anger, he came to me and gave me an option. And I took it. You, uh, you were or are a homosexual? No. You, oh, you had lost your love, I'm sorry, a woman yes. to another man. Yes. You were angry. Mm-hmm. And this man offered you what? A chance for revenge and immortality. And I was willing to surrender my soul for it. Revenge and immortality. Uh, revenge in what form? I took them both. You did? Yes, I did. Killed them? Exactly. Uh, by taking their blood? As much as I could. Apparently sufficiently. Yes. And uh, you have been about since 1927. Yes. You, how old were you in 1927? I was 25. 25. And has the process of aging within you ceased? Yes, exactly. I am the same age I was since then. That's absolutely amazing. Um, do you have regrets? Are you sorry? Is it a terrible existence? Why, why would I have any regrets? I'm just asking. For tra trading my soul? What, what a puny thing to lose when, you when there's no more right or wrong. There's no more conscious. Nothing can stop you. Take what you want, and there's nothing there to stop you. Why would it be? Why would I have any regrets? When did right and wrong stop? Since that day. For you? Yes. Well, um, I suppose there's a lot of ways of looking at it. Uh, you, you, you claim you are immortal, and yet the world someday will end, physically end. Uh, at that point, wouldn't you be a bit of a lost soul? Well, yes, you can look at it that way, but how do you know it's going to ever end? Well, you don't. So from your point of view, no right, no wrong. You just take what you uh, need. Exactly. And I am curious. Now, what is it you need to sustain yourself in this immortality? The blood of a living person. And how frequently is that needed? Oh, I often do it once every two weeks, if I'm r really, really in the mood, maybe three times a week. What about the law? I mean, do you not fear being caught in the act? No. Never. Never have it. That's one of the things you lose. You, there is nothing to fear now. There is nothing to fear. Once the soul is gone yes. and lost... Um, is it, as we understand it, evil? <laughs> evil. Yeah. You can see so many people, you know, what is good and evil? Just because you're not like me, you're good? No, it was a question, not a statement uh, with regard to... Well, no, no, well, uh, here's, what, here's what I'm trying to get at. Good. Doesn't a normal man kill? For his food? Yes. For his freedom? Yes. So what's evil? Well... You see it as, as black and white. Possibly the surrendering of one's soul uh, is an evil thing. I, I, I don't know that for sure. I'm, I'm asking. I, I kind of feel it is. Well, that's, that's one interpretation of it, I guess. You can uh -huh. say that. Okay, if I am evil, I'm evil. Subjective. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, among my, among my brethren, we don't see anything evil about it. I understand. Uh, have you brought others into this same situation? A few. Some that I feel are worthy. Worthy. Yeah. What, some, are, some aren't. What, what would make a person worthy of receiving this... Uh, uh, this gift from your I'll give you an example. We had one that we brought across, and eventually his conscience got to him. Okay? Yeah. That's a mistake. We can't have that. Once you decide to come across, you have to abandon everything. Are there, everything. Are there many like you? There's, yes, 
more than you would you would believe. They could be your next door neighbor. They could be a cop driving a police car. I appreciate your call, Peter. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. That's kind of chilling. I just can't believe I've gotten through. Well, you have. I, and, uh, so just sort of take a deep breath and tell me what you mean. I will. Um, I, cause I believe in you, and I don't know who else to turn to. Um, I have two things. Um, one is I was introduced to a nurse in Reno, and I spoke to her one evening, and she told me of a doctor that could help me. That could possibly help me, and she spoke to him that evening. But he and I remember this: um, that he did not want to speak to me over the phone. That he wanted me to call the following morning at his office. What are we talking about here? Um, first was <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. The first one would be um, of someone who's worked for the government for over ten years at Area 51. You and know, you know somebody. I. <sighs> Wait till I finish the story. Hard. You're not going to believe okay, what you, happened you, to me. You, I'm, I'm trying to get the story. I, I, so, I realize. So you know somebody who works at Area 51? Well, not. I don't know him very well. I am trying to hide at this point. Why? And keep a low profile because Why? I've had mental health and uh, the police at my door, they were wanting to take me away. Why? Um, because of my experiences. Um, what experiences? Hold it. Slow down. Slow down. What experiences? Um the video studies that I have and the memories that I have what do you, um, that I've seen. Wait, hold it, hold it, slow down. What what, vi what video footage? I have video footage of someone being brought back through a closed window and they were not in solid form. And I need to get this to you. I need an address as well before we hang up. I need an address. No, we, we do not, we're not accepting mail like that. Uh, here's what you've got to do. Oh. You listen to me very yeah. carefully, all right? Find a friend who owns a computer. Oh, yes. That shouldn't be real hard. No. And uh, they, almost anybody uh, who's a, you know, even a good quarter of a geek, let's say, knows how to turn video into a video file very quickly. All right. And they can be sent to me that way at my email address, which is artbell at mindspring.com. Yes. yes. Okay? That one I know. Okay, right. no, that's what I will do then. I didn't realize. That's the way um, you can do it. Okay, I didn't realize that. I thought I could just send it in the mail. All right, now you've had UFO experiences as well. Oh, yes. Um, some of the video footage that I have, well, it's exciting, and uh, you'll truly want, want to see it. And okay. So anyway, but some of the encounters and some of the memories I've had of being taken, um, like I say, I'm I'm not in that case, and this is very real. Are any of these uh, sexual in nature? No, no, they're not. Okay, all right. Um, but the what happened with the doctor? Um, he told us that he did not want to speak to me on the phone. That he wanted you to so, come. Yeah. So anyway, the next, and knowing that he worked for Area 51 for over 10 years, I I knew not to call him, Art. I knew it. Then why did you call? Him? Because it was a, a moment in my life that I wasn't in control. All right, so I, uh, I, 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 I think I see where this and, is going. And, so, and in other words, you went to this doctor, and all this trouble with people coming after you came after that, right? Oh, yeah. All and, right, I've got and the it. things he told me. Um, like what? How that I was um, uh, paranoid, delusional, um, psychosis that I was experiencing. But I said, now, wait a minute. You're telling me that, you know, you don't believe he doesn't always say, I believe. He says, but what you're seeing is, is of this world. He says, you know, it's not real. It's not um, alien Earth. And I'm going, wait did a minute. You, did you mention the videotape evidence to yes, him? Yes, I did. And what did he say? He goes, well, what you're seeing. And I said, wait a minute. I have friends that have come over and have watched these tapes. And, I mean, they know what they're seeing. All right. Well, all right. Then here's the deal. Uh, uh, listen to me. Uh, just send, uh, please send the videotapes to me, and that will end that. Uh, what I will do is take what you send, and I will post it on my website. If what you send is as you say, with somebody, uh, for example, being dragged uh, through a window in a half-formed state, then trust me when I tell you we will have no problem believing you at all. And uh, I guess she went to the wrong person. 
going going to a, a doctor who was up at uh, Area 51 uh, for that many years might not be the best uh, best thing for somebody to do. So you made a big mistake there. At any rate, uh, send the evidence. Evidence is really good. Video evidence is, in fact, really, really good. I realize that anything can be faked these days. Nevertheless, video evidence in my mind is high on the scale. So get it to me. We'll get it on. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, hello, Art. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm calling from uh, Missouri. Okay, you're going to have to yell at us. You're not too loud. Okay. Yes, I'm, uh, I want to share with you my experience about 12 years ago. Yes, ma'am. I, uh, me and my husband uh, check into a hotel, and uh, we were in uh, uh, one part of San Diego. Uh -huh. And, uh, well, I, I, when we were sleeping, I uh, was lifted up from the bed that we were both sleeping. While, while your husband was asleep next to you? Yes, we were both sleeping. Yes. We had arrived, we, uh, you know, from the airport, and we checked into the hotel before mm -hmm. we visit our family. So uh, when we were sleeping, I was lifted up from the bed. My whole body was locked up, but my head, I can move my head. That's all? Yes. And when I was experiencing this, uh, you know, it, what happened was I was completely awakened by this lifting thing. You know, I couldn't describe it, but just being lifted, it's like not like by your hand, not like by your any kind of force. If I want to say it's like a wind, uh, you know, it's some kind of a wind, if it is. Well, when I, you know, it goes like very slow, very slow, and I was going up, 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 and, you know, I had my cover on top of me. It was on, you know, on top of both of us. Yes. Well, when I look at him, and he's sleeping, and he's facing the other way, and the, the blanket is, you know, coming off of his body and was going up with me. I was looking at him, and I'm looking at, on, uh, you know, above me, and I'm coming closer and closer and closer to the ceiling. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't move, and, you know, my body, and I don't understand what was going on. And all this time, I was looking at him, and I was looking up at the ceiling. I was looking at him. I was looking up at the ceiling. And, you know, this, this blanket completely come off of him. And when I look up, and I knew I was going to hit the ceiling, okay? Yeah. Because it was just lifting me all the way up. And the next thing I knew, I was back on the bed. And, uh, you know, when I turn around, I wake him up. He was deeply asleep. And in, a, in other words, you went up all the way, virtually all the way to the ceiling. So far, it pulled the covers off him. Off him, yes. Huh. Yes, it did. So uh, the ne the last time when I look at the ceiling, I got so scared because I knew I'm going to crash into it, right? Yes. And I look at him, and the next thing I know, I was, your back. I was back on the bed. All right. Well, uh, let me tell you what that sounds like. That sounds like an OBE. That sounds like an out-of-body experience. Now, the only thing I would have difficulty explaining would be the blanket coming with you. Normally, in an OBE, your essence, your soul, your consciousness moves out of your body, and you are able to, uh, for example, see your body. But normally there wouldn't be a physical thing like a blanket being pulled with you, so I'm afraid I don't know exactly what class to put that in. It's not exactly an OBE because it has physical characteristics that, to the best of my knowledge, usually don't accompany an OBE. Very interesting. 